I'm still recovering from the food coma of game day Saturday. Uh, it's my fault. I start with a breakfast club here in town at 8.30 on game day, and I think I walked in the house at 11 o'clock that night. And, it, you know, again, one of my favorite days ever that I've been involved in college sports. A long day, but a fun day. Yeah, it really was. And it was all UNH from tip to gun, the blue and the gold, and we might even converted a couple of vowels. Hi, good, everybody, and welcome back to the Dr. Z and J-Dub podcast presented by Provenzano's Deli and the Charger Athletics Fund. J.W. Stewart, along with our UNHAD, Dr. Z, Shay and Zender. Dr. Z, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well, J.W. It was a great week last week, and uh, uh, you know, we're going to have our, our quarterback on here in a little bit, and I just tell you, that, that game day atmosphere, it's always nice to win and win big against your rival, but uh, the game day atmosphere was one of the best I've, I've experienced in 35 years in the business. 38-9 was the final UNH over Southern for the 12th year in a row. So the Elm City Trophy stays here in West Haven, where it's always been <laughs> since they, they created the trophy, thanks to the New, the New Haven Gridiron Club. But to your point, Z, 4,168 fans, so 4,168 mm -hmm. fans. It was a great atmosphere, not only on the UNH side, but Southern had a great contingent as well. Yeah, and we expected that. And, and the beauty of, of, of the blue, as we like to call it, the beauty of the blue is – it just uh, that number of fans is just almost perfect. Uh, the 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 crowd engagement, crowd involvement, uh, the 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 four corners of the of the stadium have become symbolic and instrumental in the atmosphere. The band brought it. We have a, a young man we brought over from the yard goats. I called them the yard dogs a little while ago and got in trouble. The yard goats <laughs> who does a nice job with the synchronized music and and other things that go on. And it was just a real pop to the. To the day. As Dr. Z alluded to, our guest today coming up in a couple of minutes is Connor Dagenhart, who is the quarterback here for the University of New Haven, grad transfer from Holy Cross. Connor was terrific, 355 yards, four touchdowns, including a 93 yarder to Dev Holmes, which is the longest play from scrimmage yeah. in school history. Tom Godek is the coach at Southern Connecticut, and he's been a part of this rivalry for a long time. Also, to your point, Z, about the atmosphere here on the blue at Della Camera Stadium. He thinks it's a very intimidating atmosphere because it's almost like this mini bowl, right, where everyone's got to funnel down into it. Yeah. You know, we, we kind of get used to it. And uh, as so even saying to John and Rob uh, a day or so ago, I've gotten used to the blue. But just think you never play on anything but green when you're an, another student athlete or football player or whatever, whoever plays there. You come down there and that's enough of an adjustment. And then the crowd's full. You know, two weeks ago. It was a very pleasant day out, but it was sweltering down there on the blue. It's, it's a valley. It, it keeps the heat in there. The beauty of the trees. It's just a unique spot. And it, it just screams college football. Coach Pence, Chris Benson's the head coach here for the University of New Haven, calls Southern and UNH the best Division II rivalry in the area. Do you agree <laughs> with that? Absolutely. You know, I, I just enjoy the heck out of it. it uh, there's, I've made some friends from Southern since I've been here. And uh, – was very close to Jay Moran, who's now over at Bridgeport, and uh, have just really, really enjoyed our, our interaction. It, and, and, you know, I like the way the football rivalry is going, just as, as Coach does. But, again, I just can't overstate enough. And I hope in two weeks, homecoming, that we see the same thing again. And homecoming is a huge day here, so I expect to see it. But uh, I think we've got some things going in the right direction when it comes to college football game day. It was also family day or family weekend yeah, here yeah. at UNH for yeah. the game against Southern. So another big reason we had that the nice mm -hmm. crowd. We're three for three with perfect weather games too, Man, Z. We're living right right now, j -Dub. I just want one more. You know, I want four of these. And then after that, I'll take what comes for the last few home, home games. I also think, you know, the play-by-play the -play guy that does the streaming is, is outstanding. You know, he and his sidekick, it's, it's you know, I – I leave it on in my office all week and just rewatch it and rewatch it. You know, I might have a few critiques for him, but I think he's really good. Good. <laughs> if, if he, I, I'll take any critiques that you can give me to get better. Oh, man. I gotta, I gotta confess. It was, it, first of all, it's been an honor to to do these on the Charger Sports Network with Steve Kunze, my broadcast partner. Joe Claus is one of our students here as our sideline reporter. It's been it's been a blast to do it. I have not done play-by-play -play. prior to this. I've not done play-by-play -play for a college football game since my senior year at Marist, the fall of 1992, Z. But for, I think I've, I've done okay. It's like getting back on the horse. Well, it's kind of like your advanced internship after Marist then, you know? Yes. We're, we're glad to help you out with that. Thank you. <laughs> this podcast was my internship for a while at graduate school. <laughs> we mentioned uh, the Charger Athletic Fund, and certainly with an annual gift of $500 or more to the Charger Athletics Fund, you get access to the pregame uh, football VIP tent, the sideline VIP tent, 
and the post game reception at the German club. I got to ask you, Z, real quick before we go to our interview with with Connor. What was the post game reception like, especially after the win against Southern? You know, the the German club is really a bunch of the football alums, and it's just a nice place for us to go. And no one's really. It's just us. And you're talking football. You got a couple of football games going. It's right here on campus. And it's uh, really a, a special moment. We stay there for a couple of hours and and then we uh, moseyed on down to Lorenzo's back room and had the feast of a lifetime. Our guest today on the show is Connor Dagenhardt, who is the quarterback here at the University of New Haven, grad transfer from Holy Cross. And Connor joins us now on the Dr. Z and J-Dub podcast. Tell us about your path here to the University of New Haven. How did you end up here? So I started off coming out of high school. I went to uh, Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, started there. My first season was uh, in 2019. I was the starter. Um, won the first Patriot League championship there in uh, about a decade. And then uh, COVID happened. Had a little abbreviated senior season in the spring. Um, got on the phone with Coach P up here, and uh, he wanted me to come down and be a part of the team. And um, I've been loving it ever since I've been here, and we've had a great start to the season, and uh, I'm having a really good what time. What was it about what was Coach about- Pence or the program or the area that, that got you, that really convinced you to come here for graduate school? There was a lot yeah. of aspects that went into it. Um, Coach P was someone who, um, despite everything that was going on in the spring, constantly reaching out to me, someone that – uh believed in me as a as a player and I, I think that was big I wanted to go somewhere where I felt like I was I was wanted and I think he uh he really expressed that to me and um New Haven has historically a great program so I wanted to go somewhere where we're gonna have a chance to be competitive win a lot of football games and then uh, also with the grad school aspect I wanted to go somewhere where I could pursue my MBA and that's been uh, that's been a, a really good deal so far. As you mentioned, it it feels great to be wanted, but you're a new guy coming into the program and there's no more important position in maybe all of team sports than quarterback. How difficult was it for you to fit in? I find it very hard to fit in at all. I think it was a really smooth transition. Um, I got up here in the summer, met some of the guys, started throwing some of the receivers. Uh, we, We meshed well in the summer. I was up down here throwing with Zaire, throwing with Dev. So some new guys, some old guys kind of started learning the offense a little bit um, in the summer. So then when we got into camp, I was kind of ahead of the curve a little bit, um, had some had some experience uh, in my belt and just prepared every day like I was going to be the starting quarterback, and, uh, and that's how it worked out. So here we are recording this podcast on Tuesday, the 28th of September. At this point, the UNH Chargers are 2-1-1 and coming off a 38-9 win over rival Southern Connecticut. Connor, I was talking to Coach Pins prior to the game last week, and he said a lot of the new guys, yourself included, you wouldn't really understand the impact of that rivalry game until the game was actually over in the books. Now that it is in in the books as as another victory for UNH over Southern and 12th in a row, by the way, what have you learned about the rivalry and how important it is to UNH and the program? It's it's a different environment than the past two home games we played. It's not just the way the guys on the team get up for the game. Um, the way the coaches care about the game more than any other game throughout the season. It's the way the kind of the community and the alumni rally around us. And uh, they truly do make it a really big deal. Coach P says if alumni are going to come back for any game, it's not necessarily homecoming or a playoff game. It's they always want to make it to the Southern game. And that's how it was. And it was electric out there. And after the game, it was awesome having all the football alumni in the locker room singing the fight song and, uh, and celebrating the win. There's no better feeling than that. How long? So the Southern game was, was a tremendous by all accounts. You especially, 355 yards, four touchdowns. You were named any 10 Offensive Player of the Week. Your thoughts on your performance? I want to be recognized in the league like that. But I think at the end of the day, that's really a a team award, especially when um, a quarterback gets it like that. You see a lot of guys had huge games. I think Javon Turner stepped up. I think he only had one or two catches the whole year. And then he comes in and has a 70 yard touchdown that sparks us in the, in the second quarter and comes down with another big fade ball later in the game. You have Dev who's, I mean, he's out there just playing his best ball all the time, comes out with a 93 yard touchdown 
big 60 yard post completion. He always provides a spark and giving me the time uh, to throw the ball. Shamar in protection, he's awesome. So it's not something that th- like 355 yards and four touchdowns, it looks great on paper, but you don't really see everything that goes into it, whether it be the protection, the guys making the, the plays for me on the ball, and then the defense just constantly giving us the ball and keeping them at the end zone. Yeah, no, the offensive line gave you plenty of time. You're only sacked once. Javon, 133 yards, one touchdown. Dev, 199 yards, two touchdowns. You couldn't get him the one extra yard for an even 200, Connor? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe if he makes a miss on uh, on that hitch, he catches if he, if we can uh, get that little screen blocked up and, and he can get into the end zone. I mean, could, he could have caught a couple more touchdowns when we when we went back and watched it on film. I think we left, we left a couple plays out there where I think Dev in particular could have had um, a few more yards and maybe two more touchdowns. So that's something that we'll we'll improve on, and and you'll see out there on pace uh, this Saturday. For you guys, the longest play from scrimmage in school history, the ninety three yard touchdown. Take us through that play. Yeah, so that was something that we've been uh, we saw in film um, based on the kind of defense Southern ran, and we were working it this week at practice and before the drive. Um, I kind of went up to Coach P and just put the idea in his head of, of what I thought might be there. He was definitely on the, on the same page was already thinking the same thing. Um, they gave us the look we wanted. Um, we, we called it the O-line held up. Um, Z, my center, he, he had some uh, great protection that saved me. I think good play fake dev did a great job uh, beating his guy, stacking his safety. And we we're just able to, I was just able to let it fly and uh, ended up in a, a pretty nice play. That's pretty cool. You and Dev are only here for three games. And you guys already got your names in the record books. What do you think about that? It's something neat uh, after the game. Um, I, yeah, I, I think we've put in a lot of hard work at practice to, to be able to do stuff like that in the games. And uh, I think a, a lot goes into it. And it's nice to have to have maybe our names in the record book a little bit. You were back at Holy Cross in the 1980s. So it was his alma mater, your alma mater. What did your dad teach you? Basically everything I knew about the game growing up, he had me out there from the time I could walk. Uh, I'm watching um, old home videos of Christmas and he's buying me a little, little foam footballs and teaching me how to throw under the Christmas tree. So um, it was, it was really special growing up and always uh, being kind of under his guidance and learning a lot from him. Um, so I think that was definitely a great part of our relationship and, and brought us really close together. Still give you pointers now? From time to time, but I think he knows that I've kind of maybe progressed a little bit past his knowledge. The game's kind of evolved past the way that it used to be played in the 80s, but he might have a a valuable lesson or two here or there. Was your dad slinging around like you at Holy Cross in the 1980s, or was he more of like an option quarterback or just hand the ball off? Our under center there. Um, he played with uh, this this guy Gordy Lockbaum, who was the he was a Heisman finalist for two years. So I think that they were able to uh, ride ride Gordy a little more than uh, being being a spread offense, slinging around like we do here. So you're you're a Patriots fan, right? And a and a Tom Brady fan. Yeah. So we have Armageddon on Sunday with Brady <laughs> and the Bucks coming to to Foxborough. What do you think? Are you going to be rooting for for Brady or the Pats? Um, I, I mean, it's hard to pick one. I really like, I've grown up a Patriots fan. I really love the Patriots, but I mean, how can I, how can you grow up as a quarterback in New England, uh, idolize Tom Brady, everything he does. It's like, he's just someone you always want to be someone you always want to learn from. I feel like every time I watch a game on like that, he's playing and I, I just, I learn more about football. Um, it's someone that you, I want to model my game after. Um, so it's, it's hard to pick one. I'm rooting for a good game. I think, uh, I don't think Bill's going to be able to dial up anything that Tom hasn't seen in 20 years of playing against that defense. So I think the Patriots might be in for a little challenge, but, uh, I, I just hope that's a good game. But you don't wear number 12, you wear number 10. How come? Uh, my dad was number 10. So I've, I've always worn it, uh, growing up. I've never worn a different number. Um, yeah, so it's kind of always been something that's been my own. Do you watch Brady and some of these other guys in the NFL to see if, if you can pick up on things and study their game and hope to apply it to you? Two ways of looking at it. I like to watch Tom Brady play a lot because um, of how smart he is, how he gets the ball out of his hand, how he adjusts plays and replaces blitz and gets, gets them in a good situation. So I like to watch that from a mental perspective. And I'm also I'm a huge Aaron Rodgers fan. Um, I think that he's just – 
like so talented and I think I've been trying to pick up on some stuff he's been doing as I've been adapting my game at at UNH trying to throw different arm angles trying to make plays kind of be a magician out there sometimes um and something he he talks about is creating havoc in practice when there's not any and putting yourself in tough situations so when we're just out there throwing routes on air I'm not necessarily I don't just go through the motions set my feet and throw I try to maybe get some off platform throws in there, try to change my arm angle up. And so that when stuff happens during the game, I can fall back on my training and kind of make some uh, more difficult throws like he does. You played intramural dodgeball at Holy Cross. Is that right? You must yeah. have been doing some digging if you found that. Yeah. Tell us your best dodgeball story and how good of a dodgeball player are you? Dodgeball story is just that our entire team got disqualified because we were hitting kids too hard with the ball. <laughs> Um, I mean, we did the same thing every, every time we were in season, all, all my friends on the football team formed an intramural team, whether it was softball, basketball, or, or dodgeball, dodgeball, they, they didn't like us there. We would just, we'd go and we would just run the show, just fly around, hit kids as hard as we can. And, uh, I don't think, I don't think Holy Cross liked it too much, but we were really good and we had a lot of fun doing it. So you should be able to play dodgeball. Do you see what I'm saying, Connor? Hey, yeah, I know the, the skills translate, but that's not my fault. When your teammates make fun of you, what do they make fun of you about? I get a lot of comments about my hair. Uh, it's been, been a big point of discussion here on campus so far. I refuse to get it cut. I won't do it. We're winning. I'm playing well. Maybe if we string a couple losses together, I'll go chop it off again. I don't know. It's, this is the longest it's ever been. It's down down to shoulder length now, and honestly, it is getting pretty annoying, but just I, I never like to make changes and stuff while I'm playing well. Home is like two and a half hours away now. I can't be making that drive. I don't I don't trust just anyone with these locks. So I haven't I haven't really found anyone in Connecticut that I'm willing to go to. I've always been a beard guy. Uh, I don't like how I look without a beard. I think I look really young. I don't like looking really young. Um, I do need to trim up the beard right now, not shave it, trim it up. It's a little long, a little shaggy. Um, so I think that's something I might, I might need to do of age. We were talking about this before we began the interview, please tell the listeners and the viewers how old you are and, and how, how that makes you feel. I'm 22 now turn, turning, uh, 23 in December. I feel, I, I feel more experienced. I feel like an older guy, but my body also feels like an older guy. Spend a lot of time in the treatment room with Maggie. Uh, it takes, it takes a lot of work to get me right in between Saturday to Saturday. You'll be here uh, for two years uh, playing and getting your MBA. When you graduate with your MBA, what are your plans after graduation, Connor? Plans in mind. I want to keep playing football as long as I can. Um, hopefully we can string together two really nice seasons. I think that if, uh, if I keep playing great football, hopefully I'll have a shot um, to play beyond, uh, beyond the college level. I'd love to, to get on some sort of NFL team, CFL team, an XFL team something where I get to, to play professionally. I just, I'm not ready to let go of the game. Uh, I, I love it. It's, it's, my, it's really my passion, what I love to do. Um, and then if not, I'll have a, a psychology degree from Holy Cross and an MBA from here. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to find, uh, find something that I like to do. That's Connor Dagenhardt, our quarterback here at the University of New Haven, grad transfer from Holy Cross. And we're thrilled that he's with us here on the Chargers. And it, UNH plays pace on Saturday first road game of the season. Connor, thanks for joining us on the Dr. Z and J-Dub podcast. For having me. Again, we thank Connor Dagenhart for being with us. Uh, Dr. Z, a real impressive young man in Connor Dagenhart. You know, he's someone that throughout the department, I just keep hearing great things about from, from every angle. And that's one of the reasons I asked if we could have him on the show, not just what he does on the field of play, but in the classroom and off the field. And, you know, I, I, I can't help but kind of emote about this after that game. You know, I haven't seen him in practice that much. I've seen him a couple of games, but what we saw uh, uh, Saturday is as advertised. You know, what'd you say? The longest pass from scrimmage? 93 yards, the longest play from scrimmage in UAH history. Wow. And, and and there were several others in there. You know, he puts that ball up. I, like I said, I've been watching the replays, and uh, it's, it's fun. I And I rewind them and watch them again. He'll be here at the University of New Haven for two years, right? Connor is uh, – he'll be 23, as you mentioned, in December. 
He'll take, <laughs> take two years to get his graduate degree, which is or his, his MBA, which is great. So he'll play when he's 23 years old next year, which some people at 23 are married and have kids. Yeah, we, we might just hire him as soon as he graduates in some role in the department, you know, with his MBA and, and go from there. Absolutely. He can also bake cookies, chocolate chip cookies. See, I can't, I can't bring that up without saying that to you because you're such a foodie. Well, you know, a lot in common because he bakes cookies and I eat cookies. <laughs> you know. Maybe if you ask him nicely, he might bring you a dozen. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a demand. I, uh, my <laughs> wife makes me, I have to hide the cookies at home. <laughs> yeah, I just can't go to bed without a few uh, cookies. I think it's just, I was brought up that way. It's important. It's like a vitamin. <laughs> I like that. It's, it used to be take a cookie or take a vitamin, you get the cookie. Now you're taking the cookie instead of the vitamin. Hey, it, it, toss the vitamins. <laughs> it, you know, it's all day, all always. Cookies, milk, you name it. Vitamin C. C is for cookie. <laughs> That's right. All right. That's right. We'll call you cookie monster from now on. <laughs> That'll do it for this edition of the Dr. Z and J-Dub podcast. For our producer, Rocky Rob Thompson. For executive producer, John Mays. For Dr. Z, I'm J-Dub. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've always looked up to you. <laughs> Robbie, your friends are making <laughs> 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 <laughs>